Do you know your car as well as you think you do? Well, I compiled a list of the top things that I get asked daily, whether it be in the dealership or just via text message or just people that find out that I know about cars. And I decided, you know what? Here comes a video that's gonna help inform you about what your car's capable of. Maybe there's some things in here you didn't know. Leave me in the comments if you already knew it or if you had other things you can add. Let's help everybody out, right? Check it out, let's go. First, let's talk about keys. Every electronic key is called a key fob or a transponder, and they all come with a backup mechanical key. Here's for a Mercedes. Let me slide this out here. Here's for like a here's for a Dodge. This is on my journey. Here's for the Grand Caravan. Here's for a Chevy Malibu. There's always some sort of release. You want to make sure you test fit these keys in your car at least once a year. Most people are accustomed to using the electronic key, so they never ever use a mechanical key. And then when the battery dies, the lock cylinder is usually locked up so you're not able to get into the car. Every fob has a battery inside and they're all accessed different ways. And pry it up. And you can see the battery inside here. On this Dodge, there's a slot. You put a key in here, twist it sideways. And you can pop it open to see the battery inside there. Do the same thing for this Dodge here. And then same thing for the Chevy is the case would pop open, pop open off the back. You just pop the case off by separating the two with the key. Some newer cars have a fancy cover, so you do not see the lock cylinder. But if you look underneath, you'll end up seeing some kind of a slot that you insert the key to pop off the cover and then you'll be able to use the actual mechanical key to unlock the door. So check your owner's manual to see which version you have. But every driver's door has some way to manually unlock the door. Same thing with the trunk. You're gonna need to know where your battery is located. On this Mercedes, the battery is located in the trunk. Batteries can be located in the trunk, under the back seat, under the passenger seat, in the engine bay, or in a wheel well. It all depends on the model you're working with, so make sure you check your owner's manual to see where your battery is located. If you didn't know where your battery is located, you also want to know where the jump start points are at in case you have a dead battery and need to jump start your car. You need to know if you have a spare, and if you do, where is your spare tire and spare tire tools located? Most cars, they're in the trunk. In vans, they can be underneath in the center of the van. Some cars nowadays aren't even coming with spare tires. The cars are equipped with run flats. You need to know how much air belongs in your tires. Every car has a sticker in the driver's door jam that tells you the pressures. Your car has an adjustable steering wheel, whether it be an electronic switch or some sort of mechanical adjustment. Most modern cars have an automatic rear view dimming mirror that you can turn on or off. It senses the brightness of the headlights behind you and it automatically dims it. But for the older models, they have a lever on the back side of the mirror. So when you adjust the mirror to where you want it and you flip the lever, it now has a dimming effect. You need to know where your hazard switch is at. When you click on the hazard switch, you'll not only see the blinking arrows in the dash, but you'll see all of your turn signal and or hazard lights flashing to warn others that you have an issue. A lot of modern cars have a quick lane change, meaning you tap the turn signal switch and it flashes briefly so you can change lanes or you can hold it down or push it past the click and it will stay on. It works for both directions. A quick tap, it'll flash three times. Some models four to five, but the average is about three times or you can hold the switch down. You need to know the different lights that are associated with your car. All cars have marker lights. All cars have low beams. Then there's high beams. Turn signals, which is also used as a hazard. Then you may also have fog lights. In the rear, you need to know the difference between the marker lights, the brake lights, reverse lights, and also the, the rear fog light if equipped, which is only one single light. 
Now, don't get me wrong, it's impossible to cover every model ever made. A lot of times, fog lights are down to the bumper for the front. But in the rear of the car, they only use one fog light bulb because they don't want you to think that the brake is being pressed. Now, all cars since the mid-80s have one brake light on each side and also a third brake light. So that way, you know that they're pressing the brake by that third brake light. A lot of cars have turn signal lights in the mirror. And then they also have some sort of a puddle light underneath that will shine a light on the ground. And don't forget, which I forgot, is the good old license plate lights. These are called dome lights. They should turn on anytime you open the door. They also have means to turn them off so that way it doesn't come on when you open the door. Or you can force them on by turning on a switch. They can be located up here on the actual assembly. They can be located in the middle if you have a middle one. Or it can be located on the side. If I roll it all the way down, you hear a click. They do not turn on with the door opening. I can take it off the click, and now they'll open with the door. Or I can roll it all the way up. And once I get to the top, I can roll it till it clicks, and they'll turn on. Now, if you're having trouble reading your displays, you need to know you can change the brightness of the dash. Often with the same wheel, it's either a wheel right here, or there's some kind of a plus or minus, depending on your, your model. It's either on the dash, or it's over here. Some of them can be over by the radio. Well, let me show you. As I roll this wheel up, you can actually see how much brighter it gets. At night, this is very helpful. Let me show you the difference when it's dark. At night when you're driving, if your dash is at full brightness, it's going to make it very hard to see the road ahead of you. You can take the roller wheel or whatever style you have, and you can actually dim the dash down. It makes it easier to see the outside road. See the difference? You need to know about fuel. Most times when the reserve comes on, it means you have roughly two and a half gallons of gas left. You also need to know what side of the vehicle your fuel fill is on, and what type of gas does it take? The engine in this Mercedes is a V12 twin turbo. It generates a lot of heat, so it has to have premium fuel, meaning 91, 92, and 93 octane. When you have a yellow gas cap, it means that you can accept E85 gasoline, gasoline up to 85% ethanol, which would mean 15% gasoline, the engine module will adjust how it runs to adapt to be able to combust the mixture of E85. Now in a car that does not require premium, you can put 87, 88, 91, 92, 93. Will you get the benefits of 91 through 93? Probably not. But in a car that requires premium, you can't go lower. When you do, you risk detonation or knocking and pinging. That is when the fuel ignites before it's supposed to, so when the spark plug does ignite the fuel, the two ignitions hit each other inside the cylinder and it sounds like <sighs> kind of like a sewing machine or old style typewriter that will overheat and damage your engine. Also, diesel engines have a green gas cap and you cannot put, uh, you cannot put diesel in gas. You cannot put gas in diesel. If you mix the two, you're going to have to get the fuel tank drained. Get to know your engine bay. Know where to add your washer fluid, your antifreeze, where to add your oil. If you have other things like suspension fluid or power steering pump fluid, brake fluid, additional antifreeze. You need to know where your engine oil dipstick is, if you even have one. In this Mercedes, they do not. You have to have a special tool. Same thing with the transmission fluid. The dipstick is not available with the car. You have to use a special tool. Here on another model, brake fluid, power steering fluid, windshield washer fluid, where to add the engine oil. Some caps actually show what the weight is. Coolant, the coolant reservoir. Also get to know what type of engine you have. Every engine bay has a sticker that will tell you the engine size. This is a 3.6 liter, it's a V6. Also, your owner's manual not only shows you all the different areas on where your filters and fluids are located, but it does tell you exactly what the fluids are and the quantities. Your owner's manual will also have a maintenance chart. If not, there will be a separate maintenance booklet that explains to you all the different maintenance intervals. Nothing should be a surprise to you 
when something needs replaced. Everything is laid out for you in the owner's manual. Now, when it comes to checking your fluids in the engine bay, they all require different scenarios. Brake fluid, you can check at any time. There's a minimum line and a maximum line. When it comes to power steering fluid, you mostly do it in all models when the engine is running. There's a minimum and a maximum line. Some even have a dipstick on the cap. Washer fluid doesn't matter. You can fill it up whenever you want to fill it up. When it comes to engine oil, you want to have the engine running for about five minutes or up to temperature. Shut it off. Let it sit for about five to 10 minutes. Then you pull the dipstick and you read on the dipstick where it's at. There's always a minimum and a maximum marking, whether it be a dimple or scratch marks or actual prints on there. And it tells you whether it's low or whether it's full. And when it's low, it's usually half a quart to one quart to bring it from empty to full. And by empty, I just mean it's not touching the dipstick. When it comes to antifreeze, never check it when the engine is hot. The system is under pressure, and if you remove the cap, it will spray and hurt you. So be very cautious. Always check it when it's cold, but you can usually fill up the reservoir at any time. The reservoir, most times when it has a flip cap like this, it's not under pressure. If it has a twist cap like that on the reservoir, then it's under pressure, so be careful. When you pull the dipstick, the bottom mark is the low mark, and the top mark is the high mark. So you're safe in this area. Once you're below that, you're low on oil. Some have marks like this, others have dimples in it. Some might have scratches, so you don't actually see words in there, okay? But you always wanna check the oil, pull the dipstick out and keep it vertical. When you keep it vertical, you know that you got a true reading. Let me try this again. So I'm gonna put the dipstick in there, give it a count of like three to four seconds. When I pull it out, I'm gonna keep it up, keep it upright, see if it focuses. And you can see that I'm safe. Like you can see the top mark right above the, the safe mark. Sometimes it's very hard to see when it oils new, so you can use a white rag, squeeze around it, and you can often see how high the oil is. If your oil tends to be low, simply figure out what kind of oil you need, undo the cap, add it, Give it about a minute or two to sink to the bottom of the pan, pull the dipstick out, wipe it clean, put it back in, three to four second count, pull it and double check it again. Let's talk about passenger airbag off. Back in the day, airbags were live all the time, meaning when you got into a crash, all the airbags would blow up. Well, it became very expensive for insurance companies and consumers to replace the parts so what they did was well not only for cost but also for safety you don't want a passenger airbag exploding if there's somebody not in the seat or if there's a small child in the seat or an animal or something like that so almost all cars have weight limits or weight sensors to where there's like a 65 to 85 pound threshold before it will allow the airbag to actually ignite the seatbelt buckle has to be plugged in and it has to recognize so much weight. When it does not recognize weight, the airbag light off will come on, letting you know the airbag is not going to activate. That's all it's for. It's not an error. It's just letting you know that if the seatbelt buckle, if the seatbelt is buckled and this light is on, the airbag will not explode. All right. Most times the complaint would be, I see the warning on the dash or my airbag off light came on. What happened was somebody was in the seat when the car was started. They drove them to work or to school. Somebody got out of the seat, closed the door. Now it rechecks the system. And if it doesn't recognize the weight or the buckle, it will let you know the airbag is now off. Again, it's not a failure. It's just letting you know when the airbag is or is not on. Last but not least, we're going to talk about fuses. What they do, how to check them, how to replace them. So what a fuse does is it protects a circuit. That's a fancy term for cigarette lighter, wiper motor, light bulb. When the amperage is exceeded by the number that's on the top, this is a 10 amp, okay? And here is a 25 amp, so you have 25 on top. It doesn't mean the number of where it's at. It just means that's how many amps this can hold. You can see how thick the center strap is, right? 
Here, this one's actually burnt. It's blown. See the burn mark? It's not a complete circuit. There's a wire inside or a thin piece of metal that goes from this one to this one. When amperage is exceeded, it pops the fuse. Whatever, is, whatever popped the fuse is not gonna work. Mostly, it's your cigarette lighter, right? You try to charge your cell phone, you plug it in, and nothing happens. Probably have a blown fuse, right? What you need to know is where are all of your fuse boxes located and what are the fuses in what order? What do they do? What are they for? There's always a chart, whether it be in the owner's manual or some kind of a chart with inside the car. So let me show you. Now in the Dodge van, there's only one fuse box. So this one shows the number, what the rating is on the fuse and what it runs. Now in this Mercedes, it's a little bit more complicated. It shows you all of the locations of the different fuse boxes, what the numbers are in each fuse box, one through 27, 28 through 49, 78 through 86. And then it tells you what they are, what they run. Okay, this also has German and English, but there's charts. Every car has a chart, whether it be paper or in the owner's manual, or most times when you take the lid off, you can turn it over and it will tell you on the underside of the lid and replacing them is easy. Just locate the fuse box that you're dealing with, okay? See what number of fuse you need to pull. Double check it with the, dot, with the actual fuse box. All the different spaces, count all the spaces, find the fuse. You can either pull it out by hand or with a puller. Almost all cars have their own fuse puller. They come in different shapes and sizes, all right? You just slide it over the top of the fuse, squeeze it, then you can pull the fuse out, okay? Then you can check the fuse and replace it if need be. Do it with the car off. You're not gonna hurt yourself, right? But if the car is on and you replace the fuse, it might cause a spark and blow the new fuse. So to put it back, you can either use a tool or just simply put it back in the place that you got it from and push down, make sure it's seated. So, hey, I know we went over a lot of things, but these are all the basics of a car that every operator you gotta know about, right? It's gonna make you a more informed driver to know what you're operating and how everything works. So I always am a stickler for read your owner's manual. As soon as you have a question, just go to the owner's manual. About 90% of the questions I field at the dealership are basic operations that people are just unaware of. You know, most of the time when they buy a car, the salesman just sells them the car and says, have a good day. They never really walk you through all of the functions, but at the same time, there's so many functions on these cars that unless you sit down in the car and spend time to use every button to see what it does, you're not gonna know, you're just not gonna know. I mean, there's times that I've driven a car too and didn't realize, oh, it has this option or a reset for this or an on off switch for that or whatever. So um, I just wanna make a video like this to kind of cover all the basis. You know, if you got a, a young teenage driver, you just got them a new car, they gotta see what's going on with the car. They gotta know these little things, right? Um, just knowing some of this stuff probably could save people hundreds of thousands of dollars by just taking care of items themselves, right? Whether it be a, a blown fuse or just knowing how things are supposed to operate. That way they don't go to a shop to pay money to find out that nothing's really wrong with the car or something. So I don't know, I just I just hope this video helped. Um, what made me want to do this is I have nephews and nieces that are coming of age and are starting to get cars. And I get calls and texts all the time. Uncle Lou, what does this mean? Uncle Lou, what does that mean? Uncle Lou, is this okay? Is this right? And yada, yada, you know? So it's like, you know what? There's gotta be more people out there with these questions. So I thought I'd make a video that tries to all encompass the basis of cars, right? So I hope this helps. Hit me with a subscribe, hit me with a like. Check out all my other videos. I try to put out helpful content from reviews to how to's to just add in information from my experience over the years. I've been doing cars for about 20, 25 years now, somewhere in between there. And uh, I just like to share my information with the world to see if I can help you guys out in your day to day, all right? So take care out there.